Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today, one of my favorite topics, adjoint functors again, but this time the diagrammatic incarnation of adjoint functors. So um, adjoint functors are usually kind of introduced like generalizing inverses, generalizing equivalences, and but there's another way of introducing them, a planar geometry way, which is this diagrammatic um, incarnation that I'm going to talk about today. It's less popular in the sense that, well, it's pretty much well known, but people don't talk about it so often because it kind of uses in kind of a new form, huge quotation marks here of mathematics, which are those string diagrams, which I explained in a previous video. And yeah, with string diagrams, they really come up naturally. There's only one, basically there's only one diagram you can draw. And as soon as you uh, uh, draw this diagram, you have discovered adjoint functors. And this is kind of the point of this video and this one diagram will be the zigzag diagram. I can already draw it for you. The zigzag diagram, the only diagram you can really draw. So it's just, it's just a string. You take your hands, you uh, put it on the string, you just pull it straight. That's the zigzag. So let's have a look or let's remind ourselves of uh, two-dimensional algebra. The whole point is that category theory or at least the calculus of functors, uh, so categories uh, as a category of categories themselves. Uh, that's actually a two-dimensional algebra. That's two-dimensional calculus. Uh, we will dive into that a little bit more in later videos, but um, right now it's just this idea that I explained in the last video that you can color your uh, faces by categories, so A and B, and the functors are like this little jumping uh, from A to B. So L, for example, here is a functor from A to B. It goes from the, well, what is it, orange type A to this bluish B. And this is like, like how a composition of functors could look like and the diagram of natural transformations. You can read off the functors at the bottom. Remember that I read uh, right to left. So this is L, G prime, R, L, G, R something like written like this and so on, g prime, da, 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 da. And at the top you see L, the composition, and R, so whatever, da, 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 da. And kind of some type of string diagram in the middle encodes the natural transformations. And remember that this includes that this idea of not drawing identities. Identities are invisible, they are trivial. So instead of drawing a picture like this, I would rather draw, this is really important, a picture that looks like a little cup here. F, G, F, and there's a certain natural transformation to the identity, G, F to the identity on D, and D in this picture is uh, green, and it looks like a cup. And the goal of this whole talk, of this whole video, is to rediscover adjoint functors in plane geometry, right? So plane geometry actually should dictate the existence of adjoint functors. If we believe that adjoint functors are something important, and they have the natural meaning, they should turn up in this plane geometry because the factor calculus is actually really plane geometry. Kind of beautiful, beautiful idea of a string calculus, which kind of really, as I said, says that uh, factors, uh, factor calculus is the same as a plane geometry in, in a certain precise sense, of course. Okay, um, and if you do this kind of trick of uh, string diagrams, as in the last video, there are certain identities in plane geometry that we need anyway to make things work. So this far commutativity, for example. But there is one really interesting identity, and it's called the zigzag, um, which doesn't need to be true in general. It, it looks like it should be in plane geometry, planar geometry, but this two-dimensional calculus is not a priori the planar calculus. You kind of you, you want to enforce it to be, but a priori it's not. So this is a relation that doesn't hold for free, the zigzag relation, which is really just the straightening out of diagrams, right? And kind of the F and G that forms the zigzag and they satisfy the zigzag relation, I will be more precise in a second, but those should be important functors because, well, this is really certainly, certainly a very, very classical, a very, very a geometrical identity that is satisfied, right? As I said again, it's not always satisfied. So the factors that satisfy this identity, they should play an important role. And I hope you're not surprised or it's not really spoiling right now that the functors that satisfy this identity are exactly the adjoint functors. So adjoint functors are those that have a built-in 
uh, plain topology, topological operations, which is kind of a cool picture. Uh, so let's have a look. Um, so adjoint functors, so what we would need is two functors, f and g, and f goes from purple to green, and g goes to green, uh, purple, sorry, purple to green, and so this is f, and g goes in the opposite direction from uh, green to purple, and they should form a nice adjoint pair. And in order for them to form an adjoint pair, there should be the correct maps such that I can actually play my zigzag trick. So there should be those two cup maps, a map uh, which I call epsilon from GF to the identity of D, which is this cup map, so this is epsilon map, and the inclusion, the yota map from the identity to a kind of the converse. So those two maps up to coloring of faces with categories. And okay. And if I have those two maps, then there's only one equation you can really write down, or actually two if you want, um, the zigzag relations. The only actually way you can ever compose those pictures is a zigzag relation. It works as follows. So it's you take this diagram, which identity, identity is here, the string, and um, the yota map, and you can compose it with identity and the epsilon map just in a different direction. And then the, the, the natural thing to do is to just take this string and pull it straight. This is a zigzag relation. Um, and of course, there's a flip picture. I said again, there's only basically only one way to compose those uh, in a reasonable way. And it's exactly the zigzag picture down here. And the only uh, operation that makes sense from the viewpoint of planar geometry is that you should be able to straighten out this diagram. Okay, so we have the following data. We have two functors in two opposite directions and two additional natural transformations, which look like cap operations. There's only one way to stack them together and planar geometry dictates that we actually want to straighten out. So just grab the string, straighten it out. That should be a relation. Functors satisfying this, they should play an important role because this is what planar geometry tells us. And indeed, we just have rediscovered an alternative definition of an adjoint pair. So two functors form an adjoint pair. It's really the same as before. F and G, F is the left adjoint, G is the right adjoint. If there exists an epsilon, right, the cup diagram and the cap diagram, so there exists a co, they're called co-unit and unit, whatever. There exists a cup diagram and a cap diagram such that they satisfy the only reasonable relation the zigzag relations, now written in terms of algebra. So identity and yota, epsilon and identity, but it's really, really just um, this picture here. And the other one is just the, the opposite picture. Right. So um, the zigzag identity, so equals this one, um, so as, as it's here. And of course, there's another zigzag relation in exactly the opposite way. And I'm not quite sure which one is which, but one of them is uh, one of them. Um, and it, this is really the point, right? So planar geometry has dictated this definition. And you can check that this is equivalent uh, to the other definition of um, having adjoint functors. And then you can just play the usual game. The adjoint functors obviously might not exist, right? So th this setup might not be true in general, but if you have it, then adjoint functors play the role of allowing you isotopy relations in functor calculus. So yes, they are important from this perspective. They must be their isotopies in planar, in this planar world, which I, I think is a pretty cool way of um, kind of thinking about adjoint functors. And everything in this notion has some nice diagrammatics. I will come back to that later on. But here, for example, is an illustration of the tensor homojunction, uh, sorry, the, the other definition of the adjoint functors by that you can sort of move them around in uh, the home functor. Um, yeah, and it actually can be given a diagrammatic description as well. So you can actually prove diagrammatically that this definition is equivalent to the other one. Um, right now, the diagrams are maybe not too convincing, but they will play a crucial role later on. And you will see that adjoint functors kind of, they're just everywhere because they're kind of, Every time you can play planar geometry, there should be an adjoint pair involved. And this is actually pretty cool. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this more diagrammatically flavored video. And I also hope to see you next time.